from a, um, a TV show that I had uh, a few years ago um, called Exploring the Unknown. This is an episode we did on uh, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, alien abduction experiences, basically uh, stuff. And you've probably heard of this guy, Michael Persinger. He's at Laurentian University in Sudbury, which I guess is not so far from here. I remember flying in through here and then going to his place. Uh, to go into his lab where he puts his helmet on your head and he simulates these. So I'll just run this and this will give you a good, good example of, of that, that argument. Out of body experiences, alien and angel encounters, fantastic stories reported each year by millions of ordinary, credible people. Above us was a craft with a beam coming down. I could literally feel this warm beam shining down on us. I saw this tunnel, like a dark tunnel with a light at the end of it. There was also a guardian angel that was there. It, to me, it seemed that it was like angel wings or something were right there. And the I was in the car. A friend of mine was driving. She hit a fire hydrant. And I went through the windshield of the car, but I experienced it from the back seat. I watched myself go leave the front seat and go through the windshield. Fantastic reports made even more baffling to experts because the people who come forward have absolutely nothing to gain and much to lose in revealing their intimate and often embarrassing encounters. When people do report these experiences, often they're sincere and honest and they typically don't show uh, the usual evidence for, let's say, schizophrenia. Certainly all of them are not liars. And in fact, it only may be a small fraction. The experiences these people have had are clearly very real. The question is, do they represent something out in the world or inside the brain? Here at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Canada, people are having these strange experiences every day. The difference, scientists are triggering them with, of all things, magnets. Here, in the laboratory of Dr. Michael Persinger, science fiction is rapidly becoming science fact. A motorcycle helmet wired to produce magnetic fields which influences the electrical activity of the wearer's brain produces ghosts, angels, and aliens. Since 1971, Dr. Persinger has devoted his research to proving that paranormal encounters are illusions created by the brain itself. Tiny changes in chemistry, minute alterations in electrical activity can create powerful hallucinations that seem absolutely real. These misfirings of the human brain can occur naturally, especially in the brains of intelligent, creative, sensitive people. Data collected from these kinds of subjects has formed the groundwork for a computer simulation of a paranormal encounter. We know that all experience is derived from the brain. We also realize that subtle patterns generate complex human experiences and emotions. So effectively what we did, thanks to computer technology, is we extracted the patterns, electromagnetic patterns generated from the brain during these experiences, and then we re-expose volunteers to these patterns. Okay, how much time ago? Easy rider. Dr. Persinger's next volunteer, me. While being wired and blindfolded, I have plenty of time to reflect on what I am about to experience. A very sensitive part of my brain called the temporal lobes, located on either side just above my ears, is about to be bombarded with a series of electromagnetic pulses. The pulses will assault both my memory and my ability to unscramble information collected from my five senses. My brain is about to attempt to make sense of some very distorted signals. I sit in the dark in perfect silence for nearly an hour. And yes, even a skeptic's mind can start to play tricks on him. I feel a presence rush by me. In fact, I'm not sure that it wasn't me running past myself. I know it sounds crazy, but I really did sense that someone was in the room with me, courtesy of the magnetic influences being created on my temporal lobes. What's happening to Michael now is he's being exposed to uh, complex magnetic fields. The pulse being generated is that which is associated with opiate-like experiences such as floating and pleasantness and spinning sometimes. Halfway through my hour of isolation, the computer begins generating a markedly darker experience for my brain. At this point, there is now another pattern being generated. It's primarily being generated along the right hemisphere, which means it tends to be more associated with more terrifying experiences. That's right, folks. He said, terrifying. 
Under these conditions, volunteers have reported meeting the devil, being grabbed by aliens, even being transported to hell. At the end of the hour, I can honestly report that temporal lobe stimulation had been responsible for not only a sense presence, but an out-of-body experience as well. Yeah, in the first one, uh, it, it felt like... Um, that, that's when that thing that sort of went by me. I wasn't sure if it was me leaving or somebody, or something came by me or something. It was very strange. And then in the second round, um, I did have, it, there was a the feeling like um, I was in, sort of in, in waves, and then like I wanted to come out of my body, but I kept going back in. Yeah, I can really see how if somebody was maybe slightly more fantasy prone and tends to interpret environmental stimuli in a sort of paranormal way, this kind of experience would, would be a real wild trip. Certainly, uh, Dr. Persinger's research on electromagnetic stimulation of the brain that seems to reduce some of these phenomena are really groundbreaking and very important in, in confirming what is believed amongst the vast majority of neuroscientists and cognitive neuroscientists that these beliefs, these percepts, uh, reside in the activity of the brain rather than in the external world. Temporal lobe stimulation may not be responsible for every encounter with the paranormal, but Dr. Persinger's research may be the first step towards demystifying a large number of age-old puzzles. 400 years ago, the paranormal included what in large part is now science today. So that's the fate of the paranormal. It becomes science, it becomes normal. So I like that last line in particular, it's the fate of the paranormal. It either goes away or just becomes part of science. So that's the problem ultimately with, um, uh, with, with invoking the paranormal and the supernatural. In fact, I, I would say there's no such thing as the paranormal and the supernatural. Like the word mind, they're just words used to describe something we don't understand, some kind of mystery we haven't explained yet. Sort of like dark matter and dark energies invoked by cosmologists to explain the structure of galaxies and how they're held together, but that's not really the answer, and they don't, they don't mean that as the answer. It's not an explanation. It's just a linguistic placeholder until we have an explanation. And I think the paranormal, the supernatural, is exactly the same thing. It's just we have this weird thing here. We don't know what it is. Let's just call it something until we figure it out. It either becomes part of science or it just goes away. So let's say it turned out that um, people really could read each other's minds. And let's say we found out that the mechanism for this is some sort of neural quantum physics thing where the collapse, the wave function, and the atoms inside my neural connector substances all happen at the same time when I think a thought that makes you think that same thought and we get the square root of 1% of the world's population to think peace and peace will break out. And, you know, there was some sort of weird quantum thing. This is actually somebody's theory. And uh, let's say it turned out to be true. I don't think it is. But let's say it turned out to be true. Well, that would no longer be the paranormal. That would just become part of neuroscience. It would be like psychoneurophysics or something like that. Right? So that's the problem with that. So um, I, let's pull back here for a second and think about how the brain works. Um, so we have this, this big thing that I call the belief engine. That is, uh, we're pattern-seeking primates. We connect the dots. We connect A to B and B to C, and often A really is connected to B and B really is connected to C, and it's a good thing we're able to learn that. And that's called association learning, and everybody can do it. All animals can do it. That's how we survive. We learn about our ever-changing environment. Okay, nothing radical there. Um, the problem comes with anecdotal thinking. That is, sometimes A looks like it's connected to B, but, but it actually isn't. Uh, and this is called magical thinking or superstition. So current examples include uh, vaccinations and autism is a big one now in the news. Uh, parents who gave their kids the vaccination sequence of shots and then a few weeks or months later their child is diagnosed with autism. Uh, they feel like, intuitively, there's a connection. Anecdotally, it sure seems like it. I just did this, and then this big thing happened. Um, the problem with that is that uh, maybe that's just an accidental connection. Maybe there really isn't a connection. And, and scientists tell us so far there's no connection at all between vaccines and, 
infant autism or prayer and healing. Whatever it is, the last thing you did before you got better, that's what gets the credit, whether it's prayer or Aunt Mary soup or extract of seaweed or some homeopathy uh, remedy, which actually